Shalom Haverim! Hi friends! How are you today? This is Evelyn Goldfinger, also known as Miss Eve, having this live conversation here about raising Jewish kids. These are conversations for parents, for educators, for spiritual leaders. Thank you to everybody who's joining me today, joining us, because today we have a very special conversation about, about a very important topic with an amazing guest. And I'm so happy to bring you, just in a little while, the one and only Eliana Light. And she is absolutely delicious. She's such an inspiration. And I cannot wait to have this conversation with you about unpacking our God baggage and finding new and interesting ways into text and tradition. First of all, a little bit about me, who is talking here. Maybe you know me as Miss Eve with my puppets and with my little purple hat. But in these conversations, I'm also trying to serve not only kids, but families in general and specifically adults and educators and to have those types of conversations, grown-ups to grown-ups right? About Judaism. So a little bit about me. I am an artist. I am a performer and playwright. I'm also a Jewish educator and a cantorial soloist, starting to become a cantor, a chazanit. And I am also a storyteller. And you may know me from my YouTube channel, Torah Tron, with Miss Eve and her puppet friends. And if not, all the links are in the bio. Last but not least, this conversation is brought to you today by my new book, Words from My Heart, the Hands-On Jewish Prayer Book, which helps exploring spirituality and Jewish prayer for children and families. So, and all the information, by the way, you can, now I have some big news, you can pre-order my book. Um, it's live, the link, it's also in my bio, and it's, it has a very interesting approach, an experiential approach through songs, through games, through QR codes that get you to videos. And um, it's a book that it's completely hands-on, but it also connects to Jewish prayer and to make prayer your, your own. So a little bit about that, and there's a video and you can sneak a peek. So take a look and you can pre-order words from my heart today. Are we ready? Hi, yes, hi, Barbara, I see that some of our friends are here. I see Paul, I see Gladys, thank you, everybody. All right, let's dive in. So, our guest today is Eliana Light, and I need to read her bio because it's so amazing. Eliana Light believes in the power of tefillah, Jewish prayer, to change our lives, communities, and the world. She's a sought-after tefillah leader, consultant, musician, and artist in residence. And she's the founder and co-host of the Light Lab podcast that if you haven't had the chance to take a listen at it, I highly recommend it. We will talk about, uh, more about that amazing podcast, the Light Lab. Eliana received her MA in Jewish education from JTS in 2016, and she lives in Durham, New Carolina. And she didn't send, didn't send this in her resume, but she's an amazing person. And she really does everything she does with such authenticity and from her heart. Um, so let's welcome Eliana. Eliana, are you there? We're so happy that you are joining us today. She's coming in. Eliana, can you hear us? Hello. Hi, friends. How are you? Hi, I'm good. I think this might be the first time I've ever done a shared live on Instagram. So I'm just fascinated and delighted and very glad to be with you today. I'm so happy that you're here. And so it's like a Shecheyanu moment. Yes, indeed, indeed. And it's also a first before the new year when we are recording it live. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's Sometimes it's like the end of the year, it's a lull, everything is done, and there's something new, right? Exactly, exactly. This is the time of turning, of trying new things. It's perfect. I'm, I'm so excited to hear that your book is ready for pre-order. That's so exciting. Definitely a Shahiyanu moment as well. That's right. Yes, we have lots of Shahiyanus. Thank you. And isn't that amazing? Mm -hmm. I want 
you. Please, please. I, I'm so blessed to have this moment with you, Eliana, because ever since I met Eliana, each time I meet her, I learn so much in such a diverse way from God, from praying with movement, from we went, we went Israeli dancing together when you visited Miami. You remember that? Yes. And it's, yeah, and it's all about the same thing, right? It's about being present and connecting and the music and, in, you know, being raised. So, Eliana, I would love for you to share with us a little bit about your journey in this relationship with God or the divine. Yes. Um, this is a relationship that I really didn't notice when I was in it as much as when I became an educator as an adult through working with students, I was able to reflect and see patterns that had come up in my own life. And those of you who are educators or parents, you can probably notice this too. Working with kids also allows us access to our childhood selves and to looking back on our life through those lenses. And in particular, when I started out in college doing B'nai Mitzvah teaching and tutoring, and recognizing that my student had a lot of very valid questions about God. Um, God is portrayed in the Torah. And why would God do these things that seem so terrible and violent if we are supposed to love God and if God is the source of good in the world? And I recognize that I went through a God journey when I was a kid. I spoke to God like one would speak to an imaginary friend. God was very present for me. Um, and I didn't really question it so much. I took what we learned in the Torah as true, true with a capital T and true with a little t as well. And I also felt very connected to nature and the world, but I don't know if I would have said that that was God, if that makes sense for me. God was a very specific thing. God I had access to through the language of prayer that I really loved. And God was also the source of my conscience, the source of right and wrong. And as a kid, and you may know some kids like this yourself developmentally, have a very strong sense of what is right and what is wrong, um, where the justice lies. And that all made sense until it didn't make sense anymore. And for me, that stopped making sense when I was 18 and my father passed away very suddenly after a very difficult period um, at the end of his life. And I realized that it wasn't that simple, that good people are not always rewarded, bad people are not always punished, that there is more going on in the world than we think. And it's not black and white. I loved the ritual pieces and the community pieces so much that I stuck around, but it wasn't until looking back on it later that I realized that I had chosen to understand God differently, right? My issues with God were, if God has the power to do whatever it might be, why isn't God doing it? That's a question about what God actually has the power to do and what it means for God to be working in the world. And as an educator, I noticed that so many students had those questions. Like you can think for yourself, Miss Eve, if you or other student or students that you've had have wondered about how can there be a God if you know, fill in the blank, all these terrible things, and that it really comes from a place of care and of recognizing that the world could actually be better than it is. So it, I think it comes from a good place. And I recognize for myself that there were many books that helped me, but it was also just talking to people, people who were open about their own relationship with God and recognizing that it is much more expansive than we think it is. That's that's both the short and the long version <laughs> of, of it, for sure. It's, it's, it's fascinating because, yes, I think many of us can relate either personally or through our students with that. Um, and I wonder, Eliana, if you'd like to share with us what happened when that relationship changed? Um, was there a period when you said you, you talked to God like an imaginary friend? Was that imaginary friend no more? Or, what you, you know, I imagine major age and you're also going through what you've been through. And please, I always say this is live. This is like radio. Feel free. We respect everybody. You can share as much as or as little as you feel comfortable with because we have so much to share. So anyways, but I'm, I'm wondering the journey for especially yeah. questioning and what happens to that. And when we provide that educators and parents to kids, 
like that safe um Gan Eden version of God, right? Mm -hmm. What happens when there is a break? What happens when we eat the apple? The ap Did I say apple? Oh my goodness, that's culture right there. Well, the forbidden fruit, um, and that's a conversation for another time. But what happens when that happens? And and we are in the Gan Eden paradise, or the Eden, the the Garden of Eden. There's the English version of that. No. Yeah. Um... It was, it's interesting. So right after um, my father died over the summer, I went on my gap year trip and I was living in Israel in this kind of intentional Jewish community that we had made. And we had tefillah every day. We had services every day, which meant that I was saying Kaddish every day. And I did find some sort of comfort in that. It was more, I think, though, about being surrounded by people and less about the words that we were saying, which Kaddish is, you know, again, another conversation for another time has really nothing to do with death. Um, but interestingly, which connects to the time period we're in now, right, it was Elul for really my first month of saying Kaddish. And so we always said Psalm 27. And Psalm 27, the Psalm for the days of awe that our tradition decided was the one to say in these days leading up to the high holidays, on the surface, it seems like the person who wrote it has it all figured out, right? The Lord is my light, my help. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Whom shall I dread? And is talking with a lot of confidence. And there is a line in the psalm that translated loosely says, though my father and mother will leave me, God will take care of me. And that line made me so mad. And even though I was showing up to Tfilot and making a minion and even though I was still there on this Jewish trip, my little kind of shaky fist moment at God was not saying that line. Because in my understanding, right, my father didn't leave me. If, if God is to have a presence in my life, God must have the power to do things in the world, which means that you took him, God. I don't know how to square the two. And I'm glad that I let myself feel that anger because it didn't come out in a lot of other ways, I think, as as an older sister and as a friend. I I felt like I kept a lot of the emotionality kind of hidden inside. People were always like, I can't believe what you, you're going through. I can't believe. It's like, well, what am I supposed to do, right? Anybody who's been through a difficult time knows that sometimes the hardest thing is just like, waking up and going, and yet there's something in us that calls us to that. Um, and so, so that was like the shaky fist moment, but looking back on it again, as an educator, um, being older and noticing that Psalm 27, the person that wrote it is definitely not as confident as one might think. If you have to say like, the foes threaten, they stumble and fall. I'm, I'm great. I'm the greatest. I'm going to be okay. I'm okay. I'm okay. Like you're probably not okay, actually. Right. And towards the end of the Psalm, there's this incredible line and it's the only line that doesn't have, um, that doesn't have a second line. So poetically the Psalm is structured in line pairs with lines that mirror each other. And the only one that doesn't have a mirror is if only I could be sure that I would see the goodness of God in this world. Which means actually the psalmist had the same question that I did. The psalmist had the same question that all of us did. And the first of all, the permission that Judaism gives us to question and doubt and ask and struggle, it's part of what's challenging, but also what's very important. I have many friends who ch came to their Jewish family, back to their Jewish family, one might say, from other religious traditions, because their traditions did not invite any questioning at all. And so then they were, they felt at home. But if you're allowed to question and doubt, then you have to wrestle with it. And again, long story long, um, I read the book, When Bad Things Happen to Good People, and there was a rabbi in that book, Rabbi Kushner, giving me permission to let go of a God who is directly responsible for all things in the world. 
and that that is what God's power means. And it was incredible to, after reading that and then going to Romamu in New York and reading works of Zaman Shakhtar Shalomi and talking to other friends and, you know, feminist theologians and other people that God is actually incredibly expansive. The word that we often use for God in Hebrew, Adonai, right? It means my Lord. We read it as if that's actually God's name. It's a nickname. You know, you've probably experienced this too, where you're helping a student with their be mitzvah and they're trying to read and they go, Baruch Ata yeah, and we're like, stop, <laughs> don't say it. Like it's Voldemort or something. When in fact, yod heh vav heh, God's proper name, we can't pronounce it, but we can feel it and we can experience it and breathe it. And even in our bodies, we can be it. That's so much more powerful. And that that actually does have a meaning. It has something to do with being. You can hear haya, hove, hiye, was, is, will be. There's no present tense be in Hebrew. You know, if I was going to say, I am small, I would say, aniktana, I small. There's no present tense am verb. Except for God. God's proper name in our tradition is, is, right? Which, at least for me, totally changes the game. It means that any of the words that we use are poetry and metaphor, and that unlocks it so much. I don't have to look at the tefillot as literal, and I don't know if our ancestors did either. What they are doing is trying to put into words something that fundamentally cannot actually ever be put into words, which is our experience of something bigger than ourselves. Um, and again, long story long, that's one of the reasons that I fell back in love with tefillah is seeing our language for God as this beautiful, one might say like set of paints, right? These colors that we've inherited, that we get to paint with these colors also. And we also get to add our own creativity and vibrancy to that conversation. This is so interesting, Eliana. Um in so many ways. And for those of you who are listening and are wondering, tefillah is prayer. Jewish prayer is called mm -hmm. tefillah. Thank and you. And, and by the way, like in this, I don't know, 15 minutes we've been together, you can have like a zillion uh, branches of these conversations and, and, and study like so much from what you shared with us so generously. Uh, one thing that you should do besides getting amazing books on any of the subjects. It's check out and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Uh, Eliana's podcast, The Light Lab, I know I do. And I always learn so much. They go so deep. And and there's there's always so much to, to learn, to reflect upon, to dwell. Uh, I love what you said that, first of all, this book by Rabbi Kushner gave you permission. This is, uh, these are the words. You, you, they gave you permission sometimes as educators or parents or spiritual leaders, right? And or, um, isn't that our role basically mm -hmm. to is or what, you know, to teach structure, but at the same time, open the doors. How do we do that in a way that, that kids feel safe? Maybe it has to do with age or their exposure, but at the same time, allowing them in, allowing them to see, you know what? Yes, this is tefillah, but you get to pray with your own words. Mm -hmm. And yes, maybe God is not only the imaginary friend, but if you have a dude in the sky, right? And I'm quoting yeah. one of her songs because she's so amazing that she doesn't only live by this, she creates and shares so much. And, and, and that album, Eliana, is, is really something. It's really part of your grappling with this idea of God and your God project that this is our next question into song, right? So... So yes, it's okay to have that imaginary friend and ta 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 because when you grow, right, child that I'm educating or I'm trying to help you discover this world, this might not be enough. And that's okay because, you know, life is about growth and about change and about evolving. So why don't you bridge us to that, um, the God Project, right? And how you spell that and, 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 and all those <coughs> names for God that we completely not use enough. Yeah, what you were saying about invitation is really important. I, I want to go back to that for a second, because that's absolutely true. Um, what we 
can be as educators and anybody who cares for kids is we can give permission and we can invite, we can invite in curiosity, we can invite in multiple perspectives, especially under this umbrella. Um, and it really does also have to do a lot with where the kids are developmentally. This is something that I learned with um, Miss Emily, Dr. Emily um, Aronoff, our friend, and looking more into spiritual development. Little kids, let's say between like the ages of one and five, um, they love talking about God. And it's not complicated for them, right? If they'll have questions about God, and they'll wonder and they'll want to hear what you have to say grown up, but they also might say really interesting or profound things about God that you never would have expected. Um, for them, spirituality is really like a mixture of things that they feel, things that they see, things that they've heard. And it doesn't have to make sense. You know, these children are in a place of play and in a place of imagination and in a place where they're learning new things about the world all the time. And when they're learning about gratitude, to conceptualize God as where our thank yous go for the big things in our life make, can make a lot of sense for someone at that age. And it's also something that we can kind of help pull the thread through as they get older. Um, there is an old Disney movie called Bed Knobs and Broomsticks. Have you seen this movie? Oh, yes, with Angela Lansbury, of course. Yes. And, and it has, I'm sorry, but you know, Disney fan. Um, <laughs> It has both animation and, I mean, it, it's a people's mm -hmm. movie. I, that's how my kid calls it, movie with people. But there's animation in it. And we're talking like, this is this is an older, I'm not, I'm going to, don't want to insult anybody. But this is not a new movie, right? Really? Is it older than Mary Poppins? Maybe. Um, I would maybe oh. frame it around the same time, perhaps. Yeah. I'm not exactly sure when it came out. But yes, it is animated in live action. <clears throat> it's a wonderful movie. And there's a song that Angela Lansbury sings in the movie called The Age of Not Believing, um, right? You get, to, you get to a place where you're kind of black and white thinking of the world. This is the way that it should be. That plus an idea of the only things that are real are the things that I can see and that I can measure um, come into conflict with a with an understanding of God that is literal, right? So if, if you are like a 11 year old, 13 year old, and you're, you're seeing things as black and white, you're taking things as literal, then the things that we're reading in the Torah on face value, some of them aren't so great. And on face value, then being asked to ask that God for things what happens when you ask God for things and they don't come true? What happens when you pray for your grandmother to get better and she doesn't? Um, if all we have is a surface level understanding, then that's where we stay. There's this idea when I ask kids about God or even I ask adults, how did you think about God when you were a kid? This dude in the Stakai idea comes up over and over again. And it's no wonder, first of all, because here we live in a predominantly Christian society where we have images of Jesus and Santa Claus, who also kind of plays the role really of God. We have uh, depictions in art and depictions in movies, but also because we call God my Lord and talk about God in a throne. And there are these anthropomorphic poetic things that we used to talk about God. But if we keep them at surface level and we don't go beyond it, that's all that we get. There was a a teacher in a workshop I was in once who said, well, I don't want to tell the students what I think about God because I'm worried they're going to think that God is a dude in the sky or God is a man in the sky. And at least the way I think of it is just assume that that's what they think. Even if it's not, even if they have like a more open view of God, assume that's what they think and see whatever you have to say as additive for you to say, you know, the way, First of all, to say the way that I think and understand and relate to God has changed over the course of my life and will continue to change. That's, first of all, an incredible invitation and something I like to say idea seeds. Like, how can we plant idea seeds in our students so that when they hit the point of what I call the God gap, where the way they thought they had to understand God doesn't make sense for them anymore. So when they hit that, time that these seeds can grow and blossom and they'll know because they have been shown this by their teachers and educators in the past 
the way we understand God can change. The words that we use are poetic. God is something that we experience and that we share. Um, the word, right? God is an English word is not always very helpful. Um, I have like a whole list. I can send you later. Like, what are the idea seeds that we can plant? Um, I used to say to help avoid the God gap, but I don't think that anymore. I think it's a healthy thing. It's an important part of spiritual development. The question is that for so many, when that gap hits, the way that we deal with it is by rejecting, right? And often rejecting God means rejecting Judaism or at least um, the religious ritual and therefore community aspects of Judaism. Um, but then the other option is to evolve how we understand God. So many people I see as adults who have come back to Judaism or who have found ways for it to work for them are doing so because they because they have a, a version of thinking about God and Torah that works for them and that feels real, um, that isn't just a surface level reading. Um, when I started thinking about all of this and doing it more in my professional life, I spelled uh, God, G exclamation point D with capital letters. Um, I might have seen that first again with Rabbi Zalman Shachter Shalomi um, in his great book, Jewish with Feeling, but I had seen it a couple other places as well. These days, and this started about a year or two ago, these days I spell it lowercase g, question mark, lowercase d. Um, and I love talking to students about what those different symbols might mean and doing midrash commentary for them. You might want to try, listener, what if it was g um, apostrophe d? What if it was g ampersand d? What if it was g, you know, what else? Um, well, hashtag I d, yeah. So I was going to share that, uh, inspired by all of that, and, and, and I'm sure you've been a great influence too. Uh, I spell in my book, God, as capital G, star, like the star from the mm. telephone, D, um, lowercase D. Because first of all, I love the sparks, the divine, it inspires me to that, but it's also an asterisk because I actually say in the book, even though it is for young children, um, you have other names for God. And when you yeah. see the book, which is not G-O-D, you can say, I don't know, you can say Hashem, you can say Mother Nature, Spirit of Life, mm. right? You can say Shekhinah, the yeah. Divine Feminine. And, and also, wait, let's talk about PR for God for a second. Um, I understand Avinu Malkeinu, which we're going to say a lot. It's a very masculine, very structured, our yeah. father. But what happened to all of these things? Why didn't they get PR? Like, there are some, um, like, I want to ask you, Eliana, can you please share with us your favorite God name of the moment or at some point in your life? My favorite God name. I have a couple that are coming to mind. Um, the first one these days is Macomb, which it literally means place, um, which brings to mind, A, what does it mean to have particular places that help us feel that connection with the divine because I've I've I don't think about my relationship with God as one of belief anymore I think of it as an orientation almost um, a, a choosing of feeling and experiencing the world in a particular way um, belief is just too much of a binary for me that's a I do or I don't where in fact it's a lot more nuanced than that um, so it's where are the places where I'm able to access this more but also how can I access that in any mock home that I'm in in any place that I'm in um, another favorite one that also has kind of high holiday overtones is Av HaRachamim um, Av HaRachamim literally translated means father of compassion. However, if we take one step deeper, it opens it up for us. And I think sidebar, part of the PR is allowing ourselves to take one step deeper, right? When we read Torah, we read it with commentaries and we want to know who said this and we want to talk about our opinions about it, but we don't always do the same thing for Sidur. Um, we don't always do the same thing with our liturgy and our prayers. And I think maybe we should, and we could. Um, so, and you do. And, and we, yeah, I, I certainly aspire to do so. <laughs> um, to I mean, I've heard you doing it. It's right there at the, your podcast. Like, 
so deep, so much. Yeah. You dwell on one phrase or one bracha for a whole episode. And you know what? Sometimes it's not even enough. It's never enough. It's never enough, right? So I'm so saying that you're, you're absolutely doing it. But I understand that we don't do it enough mm -hmm. being a thing. And also, yes, remind, you remind me of another conversation is, do we talk, not you, not me, but especially not you, but do we talk about God enough right. and in Judaism? But that's like a question for later. This is like, hang on, everybody. We're getting there. Yeah, we're, get, we're getting there. Um, just to say, um, right, Ava Rachamim, Father of Compassion, um, the root of Rachamim, Rechem, means womb, um, which means that if you take that together, you have womb father. Um, or what it really means, I think, is all of the aspects of parenting all in one thing with a root of compassion. It is both gendered and genderless and all encompassing, um, which I find particularly, particularly beautiful coming from a tradition that is very gendered and names for God that are often gendered. One of the things that I definitely find challenge and productive challenge, I would say, is how do we, um, what does it mean to come from a tradition like this, where even our mystical tradition is very, um, like, feminine energies, masculine energies, feminine names for God, masculine names for God, what does it mean to both see gender as a crayon box to play with, and reject any natural binaries, but again, that is also a conversation for a different time. No, I don't think we talk about God enough. Um, and I think one of the best ways we can talk about more, God more is by using the word God less. Just like what you said in there about using the different names for God. That's planting an idea seed already, just in terms of using it. God is one word in English. And yet God's name in Hebrew, yod -Hey -Vav -Hey, by not being able to be pronounced and by meaning is opens up an entire world of possibility. And we have it. There's over, I, based on works that my teachers have done, have around 135-ish names for the Holy One, just from like traditional Jewish canon. So we're not even talking mystical names or feminist names or modern names. Um, and we also have permission, um, we also have permission in the Talmud, and I can kind of go through this if it's helpful, but to create our own names from our own experiences. I was going to say, I I'm sure other people um, call God this, but one of my favorite ways of approaching God lately is as the greatest artist. And I just really mm -hmm. didn't think, like, think of something. But to me, I feel like that reminds me that we are also works of art mm -hmm. with the, the gift of also creating beautiful, amazing, fun, um, deep, meaningful things. So, yeah, the greatest artist, that's mm -hmm. how I... I like it that in English it doesn't have a gender artist, right? So if I yeah. think in Spanish, I have to... Yeah, it's kind of... Well, but it's yeah. the same word. You can say el artista, which is a male, or la artista. But the word mm -hmm. artista is always the same. That's interesting. I, I never thought of that. Anyway, so here's mine out there. And I actually share that in the book with the kids because I said you can name this and that. And this is my way of lately of approaching God, say greatest artist, and I just try to see the world, this creation as a work of art. Mm. Um, but it never ceases to impress me. That's beautiful. Oh, thank you. Going back a little bit, when we say we don't talk about God, um, <laughs> are we referring specifically to the Jewish community, to the non-Orthodox Jewish community, to the world in, like what, because I believe that other cultures, other religions specifically do talk a lot about. Oh them. yeah. Have you ever been to a interfaith gathering where like the leaders of the different faith traditions have something to say? Uh, I would say more often than not, it's certainly not true everywhere, but it is, it is the Jewish presence that invokes God the least. Um, I think part of that is because of our tradition of questioning. We don't want to assume what everybody thinks about God. We don't want to assume a set of beliefs, even though um, there's a prayer that some congregations sing at the end of Friday night services. It's called Yigdal, and it's a poetic retelling of Maimonides' 13 Principles of Faith. And 
sometimes when I lead it and I'm feeling particularly sassy, I'll say, and now let's sing a list of things about God we may or may not believe. Like, I don't know, if, I don't agree with all the things in Yigdal. It's like not my personal theology. And yet we still have these words from our ancestors and there's so much in them. Part, when I say I don't think we talk about God enough, part of it is to, again, plant these seeds of expansiveness. But then I think the bigger question is, why does any of it matter? My goal is not actually to convince every Jewish person to believe in God. First of all, again, I think belief is a binary and I don't subscribe to it. Um, there's also this idea that, oh, everybody believes in something and you call it whatever you want, but I'm gonna call it God. That's also fair. But, but what I think the God, one might say the God concept or the God orientation what I think it actually does for us as human beings, and especially I think in a Jewish view of it, is it is a recognition that we are part of something greater than ourselves, right? The statement, our greatest prayer isn't a prayer at all, it's a statement. Shema Yisrael, listen up God wrestlers. yod heh vav Eloheinu, all that is, is our divine one. All that is, is what we are putting above ourselves. Human beings are wired to worship. We're going to worship something, right? What are we worshiping? All that is, the is-ness of everything, presence. And what about that is-ness? All that we are experiencing right now on this planet and in this universe, yorhevov echad, interconnected. That's it, right? And Thinking about that statement for me with that translation is so powerful because if I understand myself as being part of a interconnected world, I recognize I can't actually do anything on my own. Most of this world was here before I got here. And that can lead me to an orientation of gratitude, of awe, of empathy, and of working together. And that's the only way I think that we're going to actually create that better world that we're talking about or that we're striving for, is to feel it, give ourselves the opportunity spiritually to feel that oneness, to sink into that connection, to cultivate that as a muscle so that we can feel it more often, and then use that to go out into the world and make it come true, right? One of my favorite teachings or things to explore is that in the Shema, we say it as a statement, but in the Alinu, we say it as a future tense thing, right? Bayom hahu yihiyeh. On that day, yod heh vav -Heh will be one and yod heh vav -Heh's name will be one. Well, if it's true right now, what does it have to do with that day? Why is it only true on that day? In my opinion, it's because yod heh vav -Heh all that is is one, is a truth fundamentally about our universe that we know, that we see, that we feel. But we're not all acting like it. Because if we actually acted like it, I think almost everything in the world would be different. Our economic systems would be different. Our boundaries would be different. The way that we treat each other would be different. And we can do it on an individual level and we can practice that, but it's getting to that massive scale that's the bayom hahu. So what does it mean? In as much as we can, in an aspirational way, to live with that reminder that all is connected, that all is one, how could it actually not just change our actions towards the good of the world, but imbue our lives with a sense of gratitude, of grace, of love, of joy and an appreciation that can help us thrive even when things seem very difficult. Thank you, Liana, for sharing that. And, and you reminded me of one of your songs, actually, that I've used in class in, 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 in spiritual worship um, and prayer that um, actually it's great for the God gap and how to get kids, maybe not at teenage years, but you know, from that one to five on, which is these are the hands of the Holy One, right? Mm -hmm. and, and, and I, I guess it is what you're saying, right? And this is your song, so you believe that. And I know that because you're super authentic and, 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 and that's great because you don't, you don't cover you're grappling with the concepts. You just mm -hmm. translated Shema Israel, Israel, not as Israel, the people of Israel, 
but Israel following the person Yaakov wrestling with God, the wrestlers with God. So it's already in, within our DNA, right? So you, you were saying that this, if I, when that day will be Adonai Echad or one God, because we're not behaving like that, because why? We would need to remember that we are partners, right? In this creation. Mm -hmm. And we're, like you asked, where are the hands of God, right? How is God gonna hug me or hug a friend or, or you know, give a hand for somebody who, who has fallen to stand up? And these are the hands of the Holy One, these are, right? Um, and so we are, when we're partners with God, approaching that, 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 that oneness and, and, and that idea that God is through us, right? That we are these vessels, that mm -hmm. we are the instruments of God and that we are here with a mission ultimately. We're here with a purpose or that orientation, right? Like, like uh, that, um, that compass. Mm -hmm. I want to ask you something um, in these terms. And I know we said we will talk about the field and we have been a little bit, but before we dive into that, as adults, as parents, as educators, when we don't have these ideas clear or when we are in seasons of being fighting with the notion of God, we still have our job as educators or as parents to educate our one to five year old, right? Let's take that when the, the, the suspension of this belief is there, right? When we have this agreement that magical, playful thing can happen. What do we do or what, are, what is your advice or in your experience? How, because to a four year old, it's like, there are some things you wouldn't tell them. Well, right now I'm in a place where I really am not sure that God is there or I'm struggling with it. It's just gonna be confusing to them. Or even if you're in a school and you're supposed to teach tefillah and talk about God and you are having very, not like questioning, but deep um, struggling with that. How do you do that bridge? I don't know if you have to teach math and you don't believe in math, right? Or you're fighting with math. I don't know if that's mm -hmm. going to be an issue. Like two plus two at the end of the day, you're going to say it's four and I don't think you, you will sleep at night. But I'm asking about the other thing. Do you, uh, am yeah. I asking a question? Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. And we know, or at least I know, that my favorite teachers from my childhood and from now, my favorite teachers are the ones who are enamored with the material, right? It's not just that they were told that they had to teach it they love it so much it means so much to them and they're teaching it to us because they care about us and they want us to have this in the world whether it's math whether it's science or reading right i love this so much and i'm so excited to share this with you because i care about you and so often we ask people to teach tefillah and they don't have that relationship with tefillah but i don't think it's the fault of their own it's because we're not giving people the space to talk and to wrestle and to explore with what it means. I actually do think and I don't know is a very powerful answer. I don't know, let's explore it together. I'm not sure, but here are a couple of ways that I know we might be able to think about it. Um, here's what I think now, but that's different than what I used to think. Um, I think those are all totally valid examples. Um, and I think this is a journey that adults often end up going with their going on with their kids, even people who are right because it's very easy to be involved in Jewish life, even ritually, and not think about the God question at all, actually. Um, but I often get questions from parents. You know, my three-year-old asked me why um, why God made it rain when we wanted to go to the park, or my three-year-old asked me. Um, if God created, this is a, this one gets tossed around a lot. If God created everything, who created God, mm -hmm. right? Questions like this, that the parents are like, I don't know what to do with this. And then I feel like I get to offer them a way of seeing that they have maybe never explored themselves, which is why I love doing family programs around God, because it's also, it's that tikkun. It can be a change, a helpful fix and a healing for the adults in the room also. And what you said about teaching tefillah is one of the reasons that I love doing learning around teaching tefillah, because I feel like we often 
first of all, we've decided as a Jewish community, especially as a liberal Jewish community, that prayer and liturgy is something worth focusing on. Even if we only have two hours in the week, we're going to spend a significant amount of time focusing on tefillah. So if we're going to do that, can we as an organization and or me as an individual take the time to think about why this is important, right? Can I have a why? Because if I don't have a why, how are the kids gonna have a why? And if the kids don't have a why, they're gonna see through that very quickly, right? They're gonna realize it's unhelpful, especially since we have this kind of evergreen challenge of most of the students who come to our Hebrew schools in, in the liberal Jewish world, um, most of them do not go to traditional Jewish prayer on a regular basis, or it's not something that they're being shown from their parents that it's important, right? And that's a challenge that we all face. But I think, at least for me, and I have a sense of what my why is, and we can get into that if we want to, even though I know we only, we only have a couple minutes left. Um, but as you can hear, I could talk about this uh, forever. And I, and I, and I could um, <laughs> have this conversation forever. We were all uh, friends, but I, I'm guessing we will have a second part because the tefillah, it's like, <laughs> we're just to. getting there. Yeah. yeah. You got to have a why. That's really the short answer. <laughs> I could have just said that. Yes. But it, it's also, um, it's to have a why, but also once you have a why, you have to have a way. <laughs> Ooh, I like that. Why leads to way. Yeah. That's beautiful. Just, you know, something that energy wanted to manifest itself. Just, just a chance your kids <laughs> i won't say that for your old but with the 18 year old you can maybe share that right probably yeah probably more than you think right mm -hmm. so first of all thank you uh you have given us so much so many resources just a little part guys by the way if you came all the way just you know rewind is that do people know how to do that anymore um go back to the last few minutes because eliana just offered a platter of resources that we can use like this afternoon with our kids. Um, I'm, I'm serious. And I would love for us because our next path was, you know, reaching to God. And one of the ways is tefillah. And I love it because you come from the way your work nowadays, your work is all over because you've been so um, around this for so long. Oh, I think Eliana mentioned this, friends, her connection, not to God and not to music and the universe and the earth, but to internet. Oh, there you are back. That's the one that sometimes, <laughs> but you're back. So yeah. anyways, um, I have the approach now with the book of, of more Kavana, of the intention and use your own words to start with. And on the other hand, which this is what I love, Eliana and, and her people, <laughs> let's call them, and Rabbi Josh and Cantor Ellen and all of your guests through the podcast and through all the programs that you do, honestly. But that's like maybe an accessible way to just, you know, open your phone and, and go there. They, they take us on a journey. They show us a way of getting to that why. Um, so I, I, I'm not, you know, being paid to say this. I'm not... I don't know, I'm not a groupie. I just, this is a podcast that really speaks to me because I feel like we are in Chavruta together. We are starting mm -hmm. together and I'm learning new things and I'm, I'm, I'm grappling with the ideas that I have. Um, and I want to share this. This is why this conversation started because they're like, I want to have a conversation about this with Eliana. Wait a second, why just me? Why don't I invite more friends and see what everybody thinks? And by the way, we would love to hear your comments and your thoughts and your questions on this. So, uh, before we close, first, if there's anything else you want to add now, and hopefully there will be a second time, but please uh, share a little bit with us about your work, your offerings, and your amazing podcast. Sure. Well, thank you. I That's how it started for me, too, which is I want to have conversations with people about this, and we might as well share it because I bet there are some other people out there who could value, find value in it. And so I'm so grateful that you're doing it too, so that we all get to benefit from that as well. Um, it's exactly what you said. I wanted to create a, a, a connect, a network, a home, a mock home, a place one might say, where we can explore and play with and experiment with our 
liturgy, our liturgical tradition, and our prayer practice. And seeing them both as separate things, um, liturgy, the, what we have inherited from our ancestors, and prayer, which comes from our heart, um, from our own hearts, each of us, and exploring that together. And so the podcast is takes two forms. There's an interview format, and then there's a roundtable format where we look at one piece of text very, very closely. Um, and again, we could spend an hour talking, right? We One of our episodes was on just the words Baruch Atah yod hey vav hey, and there was so much to talk about. What is a place outside of a prayer setting itself where we can explore so that when we go back to those words, if we find them in the prayer book, they can hit us a little bit differently, connect a little bit differently. And how might it change us as we move out into the world? So we have the podcast, which you can find wherever you get your podcasts, the Light Lab podcast. We also have a new website. It's just a landing page now, but there will be more, lightlab.co, where you can see the podcast. And we're also starting to do more trainings. We want to do cohort-based learning, more classes, hoping to offer those things over the course of the year. Um, to give us a space to talk about tefillah education, which is something that a lot of synagogues and day schools and places struggle with. Um, but just like many of the struggles in our Jewish tradition, it is a struggle worth having. And how can we have it together um, and not be alone in that? I love that. Um, and I remember just recently, um, I, I listened to one where you were comparing tefillah with um having with a musician having to play mozart mm -hmm. Bach, or beethoven right it was like this amazing masterpiece written years and years and years ago and you have to to play it as or make it a way that it will still come from your heart and from you yeah. and i could totally relate to that because to me as an actor you know, you're reciting shakespeare right uh, these words were written, like not even talking about me specifically and trying to pronounce that English, right? <laughs> Maybe I, I, I do it in Spanish, right? So, but we are trained to own the words of others in the best possible ways without mm -hmm. copyright infringement. <laughs> um, and and it's interesting because in Spanish, to inter the, the verb to interpret, it's it can mean um, to understand something, like a translator mm -hmm. is an interpreter, but also a performer. It's an mm. and it's somebody who interprets. So to me, uh, that makes total sense, right? You are just a part of that, trying to, and, and great actors, right? They make it their own. When you see an actor and you know that you forget that the, those lines weren't written even by them. Mm -hmm. Maybe, you know, how could they portray them with such sincerity, authenticity? And how can we reach to feel ah, that connection, that presence, that easiness, right? Uh, like that. So those one, that was one of the many, many, many things that I remember and that I, I, I really, it's going to be everything in the notes right here um, after we post this. So you don't miss one thing. Uh, Eliana, I'm so grateful that you're here and I'm so grateful to call you my friend. So blessed to have cross paths with you in this way of life. Um, so tell everybody else, I know you said the Light Lab, but where else can people find you? Yes, so the Light Lab is on Facebook and Instagram at thelight.lab. Um, I, Eliana Light, I'm also on Facebook and Instagram. Website is elianalight.com. And my music, which as Miss Eve mentioned, I have an album, Songs About God, which explores all of these ideas in musical form, um, can be fine out found uh, wherever you get your music and it's absolutely fantastic inspiring um and she has more than one album she's being humbled and they're all reflecting the that authenticity and that that search right that eliana um they're so so graciously and so generously so thank you and for all of us who are listening uh I would love to hear from you. We would love to hear from you. If you have comments, if you have questions, if you have ideas of who else uh, you would like to, to have in these conversations, if you have um, any suggestions, if you're struggling or, or grappling with any concepts in raising, raising Jewish kids um, on spirituality, on Jewish prayer, 
and uh, you can follow us at Toratron. And yeah, I think uh, that's it. Oh, wait, wait, before I forget, I, I don't want to forget this. Next Monday at 7 p.m. Eastern time, I think that's 4 p.m. Pacific time, we will have Leora Lazarus as a guest. I cannot wait. She will be talking about a journey of gratitude from the classroom to the world of stories. She's an amazing educator, uh, early childhood teacher, author, and storyteller, and, and an amazing person as well. And we'll have a great conversation. Um, and yeah, hopefully there will be more. And I will see you soon, friends. Thank you so much for being here. And remember, if you want to grab a copy of my book, who brought you this conversation, it's called Words from My Heart, the hands-on Jewish prayer book. You can go to the link. And Eliana, what do you say? Maybe we'll talk about having another one of these, but just, and this is definitely after the high holidays, people. <laughs> and maybe after the whole Chagim, like a Chariah Chagim, um, about prayer. I think that conversation. That sounds great. Yeah. Yeah. Of course, this is delightful. Thank you so much for having me. This has been great. I I really, really appreciate with all of my heart you're here today and to everybody who has joined us. So everybody, be well, take good care of yourselves and see you next time. Let's say goodbye with Shalom. Shalom. Shalom.